evening and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 12th of March and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 15th of March 2021 with me Michael Hewson before I get started. Um, some risk warnings um, before we get on to the um, subject or the subjects of the week ahead but before I before I get on to that I think it's important to look back at the events of the last few days and what's been a fairly by and large positive week for equity markets um, coming in the wake of a very positive payrolls report last Friday um, February payrolls report saw 370, 379,000 new jobs added to the US economy uh, more importantly the January number was revised upwards um, by a considerable amount as well. Um, so I think that really placed an awful lot of emphasis over the passage of this week's $1.9 trillion stimulus package, US stimulus package, which um, was signed off by President Biden uh, late on Thursday and prompted new record highs for the likes of the S&P 5, 500, uh, the NASDAQ, sorry, not the NASDAQ, the Dow and the Russell 2000, the, the NASDAQ continues to um, lag behind, um, albeit it's still proving to be fairly resilient, all told, in the face of a US bond market that continues to push higher. This is the US 10-year yield. And as we can see in early trade on this Friday morning, that um, we are at 13-month uh, highs, above 1.6%. So certainly I think the passing of the stimulus bill has prompted a certain, a fair degree of optimism, I would say, on the back of President Biden's first televised speech to um, the US population that he expects to have every single US citizen vaccinated or at least have their first doses by the end of May. So I think that's prompting a significant re-evaluation. I mean, the evaluation, the value, the, the evaluation was fairly positive in any case in terms of the economic reopening and the pace of the US economic reopening. But I think what it's doing now is it's very much placing the focus on the pace of an economic reopening. And when you've got another 1.9, <coughs> when you've got another, when you've got another $1.9 trillion of stimulus set to be pumped into the US economy and stimulus checks set to hit doormats this weekend, I think there is an expectation that you're going to see a significant um, uptick in consumer spending over the course of the next few months. And that's not even taking into account the possibility that we could see some of that money make its way into the US stock market. Um, we've already seen in the way that um, US equities have been behaving over the course of the past few weeks. We've had one stimulus package. Um, in the middle of last year. We had another one at the beginning of this year, and now we've got yet another one on top of that. So essentially over $3 trillion has made its way into the pockets of US consumers in the space of the last 12 months. That's not an amount to be sniffed at. So I think the likelihood here is that we're probably going to head an awful lot higher in the US 10 year. And that is once again, despite the resilience this week of the NASDAQ, going to really focus attention on a further move higher in US yields. Now, this is where we were a year ago. So, in the overall scheme of things, or just over a year ago, US 10 year yields aren't particularly high relative to where they were and also where they've come from. But the big difference now is that US stock markets are much higher now than they were a year ago. And therein lies the rub, and that's the trade-off. So as we look ahead to 
the week ahead, um, coming on the back of this week's European Central Bank rate meeting, which saw Christine Lagarde um, basically make the case that the bond buying program, the PEP bond buying program, could be accelerated quite significantly over the course of the next few months, front loaded, in other words, um, to support the European economy. That has given a little bit of a boost. I think to sentiment in Europe, we've seen record highs for the DAX this week. FTSE 100 once again is very underwhelming, but you've got the FTSE 250, which is actually doing fairly well. So in that overall context, let's have a look at what equity markets have done this week, starting with obviously the, um, the S&P 500. So obviously this is the daily chart. Um, up close to record highs, marginal record high. What's significant, I think, is that even though we've posted a marginal high, we actually haven't made a new record close. And I think that is significant. Um, nonetheless, there appears to be no indication at the moment that the froth is coming off markets in the US. We've got the Dow, obviously that's doing fairly well, but that's very much big cap stock. So that's always going to outperform because the vulnerable part of the US market is not your big caps, not your really big, big caps um, that are in the Dow. It generally tends to be companies like Peloton, Zoom, um, DocuSign, um, the, the smaller, smaller companies that generally aren't able or aren't making a profit. Um, your companies like Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, they're still fairly significant, um, you know, sort of, they, they turn over a fair degree of cash and they're profitable. So even though what we might see some weakness there, the more, vulnerable, the more vulnerable cohort, the likes of Tesla, Peloton, Zoom, and what have you, who, and Beyond Meat, you know, companies like that, who generally, when you actually look at their revenue numbers, they bear no relation to their market capitalization. So that suggests to me that they, they're probably likely to be an awful lot more vulnerable. That's pretty much borne out by this NASDAQ chart, because while we've seen the Dow and the S&P make new record highs, NASDAQ, you know, it's, it's falling well short and it's still below this 50 day moving average. And I think that for me, I think is the key line in the sand when it comes to the potential for further upside. If we can't get back above this 50 day moving average and this series of peaks, through here in February, then the likelihood is we're probably going to head lower, particularly if US bond yields continue to go higher. And there is a correlation here. For me, there's a correlation. At the moment, it's not showing much sign of breaking down. But if US yields go higher, if any yields go higher, then it's going to be an awful lot harder to make a case for um, companies like Tesla and what have you to continue to push higher based on their current valuations. And I think that's, that's, the key, that's the key message here, based on their current valuations. Doesn't mean that they can't continue to perform well on, on a company basis, but certainly in terms of their share price value, you know, you, you, questions still need to be answered in that regard. So looking ahead to the upcoming week, much was made of, obviously what Madame Lagarde had to say at a press conference on Thursday. But all of that is likely to be for now ahead of this week's Federal Reserve rate meeting, because that's the key. That's one of the key items that I've got my eye out for this week. We've got a Federal Reserve rate meeting. We've got a Bank of England rate meeting. We've also got a host of fairly important retail sales um, reports to come out, US retail sales, for February, China retail sales for the year to date. Um, so, and that'll tell us an awful lot about the recovery story, particularly the retail sales numbers and consumer spending. Because if you look at US consumer spending, we saw we suffered a very poor end to last year. In, in January, we saw a fairly decent rebound of around about 5.3%. So I think in February, you may see a little bit of a pullback in that number. For the US, but March, different story entirely. I mean, you know, with the stimulus checks scheduled to hit the doormats, 
this weekend and over the course of the next week or so, then the likelihood is you could see a significant end of month bounce in the March numbers. So these February retail sales numbers, while they're likely to be probably on the neutral side, they're not really going to give us any indication as to how resilient the US consumer is as we look towards um, the end of the first quarter of this year. So um, let's look at the way the dollar has performed over the course of the past week or so. And what we've seen significantly is a fairly decent rebound, a little bit of a pullback, a three day pullback and a subsequent rebound. Um, so you could sort of make the case that maybe we could see a little bit of dollar weakness in the interim. Certainly, I think in the context of this candle formation here, what we've seen is similar to what we saw here, three downward thrusts. We're getting a bit of a rebound at the moment. Whether or not we finish up there is another matter. But we traded a little bit sideways before then heading higher again. So I think we're due a little bit of a consolidation when it comes to the dollar. But overall, I still think that the dollar has room to move higher and come back towards this 200 day moving average here. Why do I think? Well, primarily because I don't think the case for a stronger euro has been made. Uh, and if the euro continues to weaken, then by definition, the US dollar will get stronger. There's also the small matter of this week's upcoming Fed meeting. And this week's Fed meeting, I think, is going to be very, very important in the overall messaging that Jay Powell comes across when he delivers his press conference later this week. So for most of the last few weeks, Federal Reserve officials, um, particularly of the likes of Jay Powell, Richard Clarida and Lael Brainerd, they've gone to great lengths to reinforce the dovish case or Federal Reserve monetary policy. Um, at the beginning of the year, cast your mind back to the beginning of the year, the consensus wasn't quite as cosy. We had the likes of some members, including Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, suggesting that the current pace of bond buying might be pared back if inflation started to edge higher as new fiscal measures started to boost prices. Now, we haven't seen any evidence of that yet, but we were never likely to, certainly not in the February, February CPI numbers. But we might start to see it in potentially April, May and June in the wake of this second slug of stimulus that we've heard that we that, that's basically due to be rolled out this year since the beginning of the year um so i think while fed chair jay powell has maintained that the recent rise in yields is a natural consequence of optimism over the prospects of a strong economic rebound in the wake of an economic reopening a faster vaccine rollout and another 1.9 trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus that may well be true, but ultimately, when the Fed comes to make its decision, the Fed's relaxed attitude to the current rise in bond yields is likely to be tested. And more importantly, in terms of the dot plots, I think if Fed officials have concerns about higher levels of inflation, they may alter their dot plots. Now, if they do that, and the talk is that some might be tempted to pull their first rate hike forward, from 2024 to 2023, that will con that will be considered to be hawkish. And if that is considered to be hawkish, then the dollar will go up and yields will rise because the markets will start to price in an earlier than expected rate rise. Now, at the moment in the two year yield, we haven't seen any evidence of a move higher in yields. If the Fed doesn't manage the messaging at this week's meeting properly, then the two-year yield, the short end of the yield curve, could become unanchored. And I think that is the key thing. I think the Fed's fairly comfortable with bond yields, 10-year bond yields, at their current levels and probably a little bit higher. What they're probably not so comfortable about is if short-term borrowing costs start to go up, two-year yields, lesser to extent, five-year yields. But ultimately, if Fed policymakers bring forward, and it only needs one or two, if bring forward their expectations of the first rate hike, that will be considered to be hawkish. And that will, pre that will present 
Jay Powell with some very present, very difficult presentational problems when he delivers his press conference on Wednesday. So that's, I think, for me, the key, that's the key signposting mechanism that we've got coming up for this week. How does j -Pal navigate a brighter economic outlook, the prospect of US policymakers bringing forward their first rate hike predictions at a time when the outlook is probably more bright than dark, while at the same time anchoring short-term rate expectations. That for me, I think is gonna be his biggest tightrope to navigate over the course of the next week or so. So that's the Fed meeting. So looking at Euro dollar here, we can see that we continue to trend down a little bit. We've got a very nice downward thrusting candle there. The key resistance on the upside still remains around about this sort of area here, around about 120. Overall, we've seen a bit, bit of a decent rebound off the 50-day moving average. But for me, the line of least resistance for Euro dollar is for a further decline back towards the the 200 day rather, the 200 day moving average, um, and down towards 117.60. So we're below the 50 day, we're above the 200 day. The 200 day has so far acted as a little bit of support. I think we're probably going to see another retest of that with resistance up or back around here, above the 50, with the 50 day moving average, and obviously this level here, which was the original breakout point for the move lower. So that's euro dollar. Let's bring us on now to the Bank of England because the Bank of England has similar sorts of challenges, I would argue, as the Federal Reserve. It's anchoring, um, it's, not, it's not only anchoring inflation expectations because UK inflation generally tends to be slightly frothier than say, for example, US inflation generally because the weakness of the pound tends to import it uh, and the recent rise that we've seen in the value of the pound is obviously suppressing some of that upward pressure. But nonetheless, um, the Bank of England will also want to, want to um, anchor tightening expectations because the UK gilt markets are already pricing in the prospect of a rate hike at some point in the future. All the talk, all this talk of negative rates, very much in the, the rear view mirror. And even though um, the January GDP number actually came in um, at minus 2.9%, which obviously was very, very disappointing. Nonetheless, UK gilt yields are still looking fairly frothy, positive, positive, and likely to go higher, likely to go higher. Let's face it, we are now a month away, 12th of April, from a potential partial economic reopening um, and there comes with that given the measures announced in the budget recently potential for a significant economic bounce back given the fact that the gdp numbers that we saw um, for january um, were a little bit on the soft side and february is not going to be much better but ultimately it's all about pent up demand as chief economist Andrew Haldane never fails to continue to remind us of. So looking at the pound against the dollar, there's a bit of a tug of war going on there with the respective recovery stories, but the vaccination process is continuing to get rolled out um, at an excel on an accelerated basis. And when the Bank of England last met in February, the tone was a little different from previous meetings because of the outlook rather than the rear view mirror. There wasn't any change in policy, but you know the tone on negative rates has shifted markedly. And, and one of the reasons for that has obviously been uh, the prospect of an economic rebound. And if you look at this daily chart here, you can certainly see that the 50 day moving average as identified by this red line here continues to support the price action. So the bank is probably going to continue to hedge its bets around negative rates. But ultimately, you know, and I know that it's very unlikely that they're going to look at going down the negative rate route, even though they're not ruling that possibility out. So it's about 
expectations going forward. Now, the first quarter GDP hit is going to be quite significant. We know that. We know that because ultimately for January, February and March, the economy is going to be in lockdown. But it's about April, May and June. So I think while we can expect a 4% contraction, um, I think there is a significant divergence of opinion opening up between some MPC members over the strength of any recovery. So the recent moves higher in 10-year gilt yields might start to generate some sleepless nights amongst some policymakers. So you, get, you may get a slightly more dovish tilt in terms of trying to keep a lid on borrowing costs because I think the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, is very concerned that borrowing costs remain fairly well anchored. And I think he will be concerned by the fact that UK gilt yield has risen so sharply in the course of the past few months. If you look at where it was at the beginning of this year, it was at 0.17% on the 4th of January. It's now at 0.78%. Well, that's the equivalent of almost the equivalent of three rate hikes, 25 basis point rate hikes. And let's not forget a year ago, just under a year ago today, um, the Bank of England cut rates from 0.25% to 0.1%. Well, I actually slashed them from 0.75%, as low as 0.1% just over a year ago. So at the beginning of last year, they're at 0.75, and then two rate hikes in succession took them down to 0.1. So the market's priced in um, a rebound to pretty much where we were just over a year ago, 19th of March. So we're back where we were just over a year ago, as if the uh, as if the pandemic hadn't happened. So certainly in that context, the, the the prognosis still looks fairly positive for the pound. While we're above this key support level here, around about 137.10, 137.20, which sort of brings me into euro sterling, which I still remain fairly bearish on. No reason to suppose otherwise, given the fact that some German officials are now talking about a third wave. Italy's announced new lockdown restrictions as well. So, you know, in terms of euro sterling, the line of least resistance here is, I think, for further losses back to 85 and then 84 over the course of the next few days. So, so very much bear that in mind. We've also got the latest UK public finances figures out on the 19th again not likely to be particularly positive. It's no secret that Rishi Sunak would rather rein back on some of the support measures that he's rolled out sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, economic circumstances don't allow him that luxury. Um, but ultimately, I think while borrowing costs remain low, I don't think it's going to really be too much of a problem. And in January, when tax revenue normally puts government expenditure into surplus, the government actually borrowed eight billion pounds compared to a surplus of 12.4 billion pounds in January 2020. February also tends to be a fairly decent month on a historical basis. Again, this time it's likely to be different. The economy is still set to be um, in, the economy is still in some form of lockdown. So I think the headline number for this year will continue to be sort of in the region of 300 billion pounds in borrowings. And I think February is likely to add to that, albeit probably not um, in the same way as previous months. But nonetheless, we can still expect to see another £10 billion of borrowing or so for February due to late year-end tax payments after the end-of-year tax deadline. OK, so um, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the German DAX, here we have um, continued move higher. In the DAX, new record highs. We've seen new record highs this week after we broke above this series of peaks through here. That would suggest that we're probably well on course to 14,800 and even 15,000 by the end of the year. Overall, these breakouts would appear to suggest that momentum continues to be positive. If I stick this horizontal support and resistance line in through here, we can see that now this area should become a fairly decent area of support on any pullback in the DAX index. In terms of the FTSE 100, it's been really disappointing, really struggling to maintain any sort of traction. But now that we've, we've this has been a really messy uh, 
move higher. And I think for me, I think the most important part of this particular move higher is that we haven't been able to get through 6,800. So if I draw in a horizontal line here, then for me, the key level, key resistance level we need to get through is 6,805 in the short to medium term to really punch on and head towards the peaks that we saw at the very start of this year when, optimi when, when optimism ultimately was, it, was at its highest since then obviously we've come off but overall you know the outlook still I think appears to be fairly positive for the FTSE 100 notwithstanding the fact that it's lagging behind pretty much everything else um, so I think even if we do continue to see moves higher in bond yields, ladies and gentlemen, I still think that the, there's potential, there is still potential further upside in European markets on the basis, on the valuation basis alone. US bond yields aren't going to erode the case for putting money in European or UA, UK equities simply because valuations aren't anywhere near as high. Now, you can certainly make the case for the NASDAQ coming back down. Um, but all you'll, all you'll see is money coming out of those more richly valued areas and going into some of the more cheaply valued areas. And I think the nearer we get to an unlocking, the nearer, the more optimism we'll start to see around companies like travel companies, retailers and pubs. Um, and on that note, we'll segue nicely into um, Ocado and Witherspoons and Greggs and companies like that. I mean, Ocado probably not so much because it's had a very, very good pandemic and may suffer once the economy starts to reopen. But certainly in the context of, say, for example, Weatherspoon, um, you know, they, they've been able to um, see some fairly decent share price gains over the course of the past few weeks on reopening optimism. And we're getting closer to that April the 12th date when they can reopen. Um, outside and the company has gone to great lengths to raise extra capital in January it raised Witherspoon's raised 93.7 million in the form of an equity placing um, on top of the 139 million in liquidity available on the 14th of January um, it's still benefiting from the business rate extensions and the continued extension of the VAT tax cuts and the shares are currently up over 60% from the September lows. So the big level for me, I think, is not so much how bad this month's numbers, this, this, the, these latest numbers will be, because essentially it's about, you know, moderating the cash burn. It's how they perceive they will do on an economic reopening. And I think that's, that's the key question here. Um, um, Greg's has also got full year numbers out. JD Witherspoon's the first half numbers and they're not likely to be particularly great. And then we've got THG Holdings, which is the Hutt Group IPO. Um, their full year numbers for this year. Going to be a big test for the optimism that we saw um, at the end of last year when they IPO'd in September as to whether or not they continue to um, push up from the initial premium that we saw when they launched all the way back in September. So their four year numbers are out on the 15th. So that'll be an interesting bellwether for whether or not we can continue to see a push higher in those particular shares. Ocado's first quarter numbers are due out on the 18th. This is an interesting chart, very interesting chart for Ocado, because it would appear to suggest that momentum is starting to taper off. We broke below this key little trend line that I drew in here and we're below the 200 day moving average. So even though last year's full year, full year numbers beat expectations, I think the big question here is what are the future growth prospects for Ocado and what are the benefits from the deals it's recently signed with the likes of Marks and Spencers? How much more um, are these deals likely to add the current pace of revenue growth. Um, so this week's Q1 numbers will be an early indication of how well the business is shaping up for a new fiscal year. Um, in terms of US earnings, we've got FedEx, always a fairly decent bellwether uh, 
of the US economy, logistics uh, and what have you. Certainly what we've seen with respect to these partic this particular chart suggests that there is a fair degree of support in and around 240 um, with the rebound in retail sales that we saw at the beginning of the year that does bode well um, at its last set of numbers in Q2 um, they were much better than expected coming in at 20.6 billion dollars almost 1.2 billion dollars above expectations obviously the shares hit record highs in December despite the fact that um, the last the most recent quarter saw very weak retail sales towards the year end and yet they still beat expectations so I think in terms of Q3 um, expectations are for Q3 profits to come in slightly below the levels or from what we saw in Q2 but as I say you know, the, 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 the price action here would appear to suggest that there's potential for a little bit more upside in this particular um, share. We've also got third quarter numbers from Nike and Williams Sonoma, both very, uh, both both reads, both of which have done very very well over the course of the past 12 months. Williams Sonoma, um, bakeware firm with a chain of firms like Pottery Barn and what have you, shares at all time highs. Um, their online digital operation has really meant that they haven't really missed out through the closure of their stores. So in summing up, um, I think the key things that I have got my eye on this week, obviously the Fed meeting, that's going to be, I think, probably the most important item on the agenda. But obviously we also have US retail sales. So the Fed meeting on the 17th of March, US retail sales on the 16th, Chinese retail sales a year to date on the 15th of March. And that'll be a very key bellwether of the Chinese consumer and how, how, they're, how they're doing. And obviously that number will also include uh, Chinese New Year, which retail consumer spending tends to pick up. Obviously there will be slightly more different comparatives given the fact that last February, the Chinese economy was in lockdown. So you could actually see um, a slight, a significant uplift because of comparatives and what have you but also the Bank of England rate meeting on the 18th of March as well. So as I say, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson wishing you a nice weekend and I'll speak to you all same time, same place a week from now. Thank you very much.